you very much. So we're going to from the top end of the gastrointestinal tract, just post gum, to the bottom end, which is just pre bum. So I'm going to be talking about colon cancer, um, touching really only briefly on the latter parts, the treatment of colon cancer, but talking a little bit also about uh, colon cancer screening. Uh, so first thing is that to, to understand colon cancer, it's not the world's favorite topic. Um, it doesn't necessarily have the sort of profile of a number of other cancers, but it is actually the most, second most common cause of cancer-related death uh, in Canada and in much of the rest of the Western world. So it's common, and in fact, you can see from that diagram, that graph on the right-hand side, that uh, lung cancer is the most common. It's, uh, for the vast majority of patients, that's clearly uh, smoking-related. Colorectal cancer, colon cancer, is the second most common cause of deaths. We don't really know why people get colon cancer. It's also the third most common type of cancer. The disconnect there is that if colon cancer is detected early, it can be cured. So there is a good argument for going and identifying cancerous lesions as early as possible or even precancerous lesions or polyps, as we'll see. It's also an expensive cancer to treat because um, of the, the range of treatments that's becoming available in part, but also in part because the surgeries and the impact on people's quality of life is significant as well. As I say, we don't really know why people get colon cancer. There are clearly genetic and environmental factors, and a small proportion of colon cancers are related to specific genetic syndromes which are inherited. That really is only a very small proportion of colon cancers. As we'll see in a minute, most colon cancer uh, is diagnosed after we reach the age of 50, um, and that's what informs the colon cancer screening programs. And the messages, if you like, from this are firstly that it's preventable because if one does screening for colon cancer um, and the, there are small precancerous lesions, removing those reduces the risk of developing cancer afterwards. And it's also curable if it's detected early. So there's a good reason, there are good reasons to have a screening program for colon cancer. Now, screening programs are designed for people who have no symptoms. They're people who are at risk but otherwise feel completely well. Having said that, many people have symptoms which raise the possibility of cancer, and it's really important from an individual point of view and from a healthcare point of view that we understand what symptoms we should be looking out for. Uh, there aren't any specific cancer-related symptoms, but there are some that are, if you like, red flags or alarm features. A change in bowel habit, um, particularly if unexplained and is, is something that's happened over a short period of time, at least warrants a discussion with your doctor. It doesn't by any means mean that you have cancer, but it suggests that something has happened, and even if it isn't cancer, he may well be, he or she, she or he may be able to help you. If you have bleeding, if there's blood in the stool, that is a red flag, and that is something that should be discussed with your family physician. It's not something that means you have to follow up with a screening test to see whether it really is blood. If you see red blood in your stool, it's blood. It needs to be tested. Anemia is, um, is a condition where your blood is low, and that's because you've lost blood or you've lost iron, and that again suggests there may be bleeding from somewhere, even if you don't see it. And again, there are many other causes, but it's something that needs to be considered, particularly if you're losing weight, you have nausea, vomiting, a change in bowel habit that's led to diarrhea. And then there are a number of other symptoms which are more general and can apply to other conditions. But again, if those have changed, they merit discussion with your family physician. These are things like a sense of fullness, abdominal pain, fatigue, and narrow stools possibly, although there are many other reasons why this may happen. But as I said, Many times there are no symptoms, and that's why screening programs are in place, and that's why there are government uh, information campaigns that say when you reach the age of 50, go and see somebody, go and see your family physician about getting screened for colon cancer. Now, the background to this is that colon cancers don't suddenly just appear out of nowhere. They develop from small clusters of cells that are benign. They're just a little bit abnormal, and they grow a little more quickly, and they don't get uh, cleared away by the immune system. And they can lead, if they grow, they can become polyps that are benign. A polyp isn't a cancer generally. But because they're growing, the cells become a little bit abnormal, and they can then become larger, and they can become more what's called dysplastic. That is precancerous, 
uh, but a little more abnormal than the original polyps, and then they can become cancerous, and then they can develop into cancer, and the various stages of cancer as well. And we talked about the fact that if caught early, cancer be can be cured. So colon cancer goes through a number of stages. It's been grouped in stages from zero to one, which is where there is very localized cancer that's still within the bowel, either on the surface of the lining of the bowel or just into the muscle part of the bowel. Stage two is where it's moved out to the outside lining of the bowel. Stage three is where it's moved out and it is the cells have gone into lymph nodes or other tissues around about. And then stage four is where the, uh, there are, there's cancer cells that have gone out beyond the bowel into lymph nodes and into other organs. It's spread to liver or lung or other areas as well. So those are the stages where it becomes progressively more advanced and progressively more difficult to treat. Early on treatment uh, can be simply surgery and removing the abnormal area. Later on one adds in chemotherapy to try and kill the cancer cells and prevent recurrence. And then there's radiotherapy to try and kill areas where the um, cancer cells have spread to other organs. So the ranges of therapy, the surgical therapy, chemotherapy, which is chemical therapy to kill the cancer cells. There's targeted therapy, which is taking advantage of new molecules that block particular processes. They stop blood cells growing, uh, blood vessels from growing. They stop uh, um, cells from taking root in other parts of the body. And then the various forms of radiation therapy to kill areas where there may be what are called um, metastases or different spread. So there's a range of treatments that are available, and as I say, the, the key thing is that ignoring it means that the, or ignoring symptoms or not getting screened means that the chance that the cancer will become advanced also increases, and therefore it increases the likelihood that it will not be possible to cure the cancer. So the risk factors, if we don't know why we get uh, colon cancer, we can at least identify some of the things that make it a little more likely. Um, as we get older, over the age of 50, the risk increases quite rapidly. Uh, a family history of colon cancer can mean that we're two to four times as likely, depending on how many relatives we have, um, two to four times more likely to develop colon cancer. Uh, previous polyps, if I've had polyps before, or I've had a cancer before, then I need a close eye kept on this because I may develop another one. And then the inflammatory bowel diseases, not irritable bowel syndrome, but inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and colitis also increase the risk of developing colon cancer. And this is just to illustrate the fact that it's really at the age of 50. It's not that colon cancer is never seen under the age of 50, but you'll see here that once we reach the age of 50, the risk goes up quite rapidly. And that's why the screening programs for people who have no symptoms are designed for um, people who are over the age of 50. If you have symptoms under the age of 50, again, you go to your doctor. There are a number of ways of screening. So this is for people who have no symptoms, and the most common one, all of the programs across Canada. Uh, I chair the National Call on Cancer Screening Network, and all of the programs get together twice a year to discuss how the programs are running, how to improve the programs, and how to improve the detection rates, and how to get more people to do screening. And the tests that they used are what are called stool tests, the world's favorite test. Uh, and there are two versions. The one we still use in Ontario is called the GWIAC test, the GFOBT. It's an older technology. It still leads to about a 25 to 30% reduction in the uh, incidence of cancer. So it detects cancers and allows them to be, uh, to be identified and treated. But the newer test that's now been adopted, it will be adopted in Ontario next year and has been adopted by virtually all of the other provinces is what's called the fecal immunochemical test that's specifically designed to detect human blood. So this screens and then there are other ways, there are scopes, flexible sigmoidoscope, which is a short scope that looks at the left side of the bowel. There is a colonoscope, which looks all of the way around the bowel. You can see from the diagram on the right hand side. And then there are CT scans and other blood tests that are being developed. Um, having said that, really, stool testing remains the mainstay of screening for colon cancer for people who have no symptoms, and colonoscopy is what is used if you have an increased risk because of inflammatory bowel disease, because of a family history, or because you've had polyps or tumors before. So those are really the two major areas. The reason we don't do colonoscopy in everybody is because it takes a day off work, because there's a risk, small risk, but there is a risk, and doing examinations like that in people who have no symptoms whatsoever is not necessarily a good risk-benefit balance. 
strategies for preventing colon cancer. I've said that we don't know why people get colon cancer, but there are data showing that a good diet and a healthy lifestyle do reduce the risk of developing colon cancer. So a diet that's high in fiber, vegetables and fruits, the sort of things we've been hearing about already, diets that are low in fat and processed foods are good for you and are likely to reduce the risk of getting colon cancer. Vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, uh, if you're over 50, is probably associated with a reduced risk and making sure that you have enough folic acid is also important, although in Canada, virtually everybody gets enough folic acid. We stopped measuring folic acid in blood tests because everybody that I've measured, for example, over the last 20 years has had a normal folic acid level. So that's not really a major problem. Maintain a healthy weight again, exercise regularly, and don't smoke. These are all recipes for a healthy life anyway, but they do also help with colon cancer. I went quickly through limiting alcohol. I'd hate to limit alcohol too much, but I'm a Brit. Uh, warm beer for everybody. So a couple of questions to think about. Um, if you go to your doctor and say, I have GI symptoms that are new or concern me, you need to know how do we work out why I have these symptoms. A pat on the head and don't worry about it. You need a little more than that. So go in, as Catherine said, with a plan. <coughs> I'm now 50 years old. How do we start screening tests for colon cancer? That's when it starts. All of the provinces, if you're 50, that's the conversation you need to have with your family physician or your pharmacist. Uh, the um, C C Canadian Partnership Against Cancer has a website which is called Colonversation. Go talk to your family doctor about your colon. Which test is best for me? That again depends on your history and your family history. But if you have a relative who has had colon cancer or polyps, then you need to see if you have a similar condition and those are the group where uh, colonoscopy may be a reasonable alternative to stool testing. So with that, that was a whistle-stop tour through colon cancer, and thank you again for listening to me, and I'll hand back to Catherine. Okay, a lot of information, right? Great. So we have a few questions to go through. Um, I'm not going to do them in any particular order, because you know everybody has their, their own ideas, so we won't necessarily stick